Nkozi sikeleli ya Afrika, manu pakani su pondolwayo, iswali nitana soyetu, nkozi sikelela. That is an extract of the South African National Anthem, which simply says, God bless Africa. And indeed, this is the time because one of the elements to take Africa, the Africa we want by 2063, is on course. And that element is the African Continental Free Trade Area, wherein all the 54 countries have signed in and at least 44 have deposited their instruments of ratification at the level of the African Union. While the entire institutional mechanism is being defined by time, the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat was established to administer the right policies needed by African governments to ensure that the fruits of the free trade area reach the masses of at least 1.3 billion people on the continent. Where are we today with the implementation of the lofty idea of the African Continental Free Trade Area? My guest today on Globe Watch is the Secretary General of the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area. Wankile Mini, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You just flew from the Rwandan capital, Kigali, mm -hmm. where you were taking part in the 26th uh, summit of the Commonwealth, and you are here in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Myself, I was in Rwanda roughly two weeks ago. Where are we with the African continental free trade area today? Um, well, as you mentioned in your intro, we now have 43 countries that have deposited their instruments of ratification. So from a, a political and a legal standpoint, we have the push that we need uh, from heads of states, uh, from governments, these 43 governments. Uh, second, we have also established all of the legal frameworks that are required, the legal foundation that is required for implementation um, of, of the agreement. To give you an example, we now have convergence on 88.7% uh, rules of origin, um, over 4,500 products, where all 43 countries are now saying we are recognizing the same local content rules, uh, the same uh, threshold for goods moving from one part of the continent to the other. This is the significance of this uh, rules of origin over 88%. That's what enables trade to happen. We've also been directed by the heads of states in February that we start com commercially meaningful trade on the basis of the, this 88.7% rules of origin that we have, which in my view is a very, very good start. Uh, the process of enabling commercially meaningful trade, either in a region or continentally, requires uh, readiness from a customs uh, procedure point of view. We'll enter That's into what we have to focus on now. I'm glad that you are just from Rwanda because this is where the agreement was initially signed mm -hmm. by 44 African countries. As you know, the African market is roughly 1.3 billion people, 54 yeah. countries. And if the CFTA goes of operation, it will be the largest single trading market or corridor in the world. What is the level of trade volume, intra-African trade volume today? We, we estimate uh, that intra-Africa trade is at 18%. That's an estimate. If you look at uh, intra-EU trade, over 70%. Intra-North uh, America trade, over 60%. Intra-Southeast uh, uh, Asia trade, over 40%. So clearly we are at the lower end of uh, this, the trade volumes when you look at regions and how much each region uh, tr trades with uh, uh, itself. So we have a lot of catching up to do. The good news is this. 
when you look at the, the, the bulk of that 18%, it's actually manufactured goods. Uh, however, it's manufactured goods from a handful of countries. Uh, but we have the baseline, we have the manufacturing capacity uh, to build on from this handful of countries that, that contribute uh, value-added uh, production, value-added exports within this bracket of 18%. So we, although it is, it is a very low percentage, uh, we don't trade much uh, amongst ourselves primary commodities. Uh, we trade primary commodities more so with the rest of the world. And so our industrialization strategy, uh, our uh, value addition, and our trade specialization strategy has to focus on um, building our manufacturing capacity for intra-Africa trade. That's what will take us uh, to uh, the 60, 70 percent intra-regional trade that we want to see. I'm glad that you talked about the manufacturing sector within the context of COVID-19, which has killed plus or affected plus 200 million people globally, plus to 5 million others have died. Uh, the continent was the least affected when mm -hmm. it comes to mortality. When you look at the length and breadth of COVID effects, what do you think has been the lesson drawn in terms of impact on implementing the African continental free trade area? I think two things. Uh, one is we have to accelerate um, industrialization to ensure that we develop our own capacity as a continent, our own value chain, uh, a regional value chain uh, network, uh, so that uh, when the global supply chain is disrupted, that we continue to have access to much needed goods, services, and products. We can only do that if we have a fully functional uh, trade area that enables the movement uh, of these goods. The second important lesson is, is that when there is a global crisis or a global pandemic of this nature, we as Africa are always uh, at the back of the queue. Uh, there were export uh, restrictions that were imposed by countries on a range of different uh, products that we needed to fight the, the pandemic, and we did not have access to those products because of the export restrictions. And so the, the, the issue of self-sufficiency of the continent is absolutely critical and is a lesson that we should, we should learn uh, from uh, not only the, the, the pandemic, by the way, but also from what is happening now with Ukraine and Russia, uh, that has also caused uh, supply chain disruptions, particularly in a very, very narrow range of agricultural products that we import uh, over reliance uh, you know, on the import of these agricultural products from one country. That's the lesson that we have to learn. We have 60% of global arable land, and yet we rely on a small country in Europe. Uh, for self subsistence on a range of different products, including wheat, barley, and, and other cereals, that um, 1.3 billion people rely on a country, as President Kagame said, of 44 million people. To the extent that from these two crises, we learn that we have to uh, trade more with one another, trade more on uh, the uh, agricultural products that we need that should be processed uh, to meet Africa's food security needs. And for Africa to trade more, there are some certain value additions or harmonized policies mm -hmm. that should take place. When you take the taxation policy on the continent, you take customs, where do you think harmonization should be faster? As you know, each country developed what they call the national AFCTAR policy implementation strategy. Well, the, the, we, we didn't cover uh, tax, uh, the tax regime in the agreement. Mm. Uh, it's, it's excluded from it. But customs procedures, the harmonization of customs procedures, the harmonization of transit of goods, the harmonization of trade facilitation procedures, all of that is covered by the agreement. 
not only is it covered by the agreement, but every state party, every country that has ratified the agreement, now has an obligation to apply these harmonized rules, particularly, particularly from a customs uh, uh, point of view. That's where uh, we will see the challenge, in my view. Uh, that's where we will see the biggest challenge in the implementation of the AFCFTA will be the implementation of the rules of uh, customs uh, uh, rules that are already harmonized. Um, you have, as you know, vast uh, 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 countries, uh, countries with vast land, ma uh, land mass uh, that have remote borders where goods are transiting. Even in these remote borders, there is an expectation that customs procedures of Zelikov will be implemented. So the big challenge is training, capacity building of our customs of, uh, authorities at a continental level so that they are able to ensure that goods transit in accordance with the rules of Zelikov. And how do you see the General Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area in unlocking those barriers? In other words, what are the missions and how do you have to execute it? Mm -hmm. Have to execute that policy? The, the Secretariat does not implement the agreement. The implementation is done by member states, national uh, governments, or regional economic communities, customs unions. Mm. However, we play a very, very important role, and that important role is the um, facilitation of these measures we talked about, their implementation. In other words, we bring together customs authorities from all over the continent, which uh, this year alone we have brought them together six or seven times, uh, so that we develop a common approach assisted by the Secretariat, facilitated by the Secretariat, develop a common approach to implement these harmonized rules and also uh, to assist them to establish the national implementation committees where they don't exist. So our role really is to facilitate and to assist regional economic communities or customs unions to be able to implement all of their obligations uh, under the, uh, uh, the AFCFTA. Well, um, by 2035, you estimate or available data indicates that the fair implementation of the African continental free trade area will lift roughly 30 million people out of poverty and generate an economic value of roughly $450 billion mm -hmm. when all the 54 African countries must have understood the nitty gritties of all of these. What are the mechanisms being laid for that impact to be felt to the ordinary African citizen who are living maybe say Polokwane in South Africa or in Makerere in Uganda or I don't know in Munduru in the East region of Cameroon or in um, Kigali? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Uh, because typically trade agreements benefit the large corporations that have the capacity to export um, into the new market. They already have uh, 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 an army of lawyers who will assist them to move into the new market. In reality, I'm not targeting corporate Africa. No, no, I'm they getting... Because they're already out of the poverty line. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm getting to your question. Absolutely. So the point is, what should be the focus of the trade agreement um, in, a, in a way in which we have to take affirmative action. We don't have to take affirmative action for large corporations because they already can immediately benefit under new markets. But we have to take concrete steps for small medium enterprises, for young entrepreneurs. That is why we uh, are prioritizing um, small medium enterprises that are led by women and young entrepreneurs in building their capacity to export under the rules of Zelikov to reach new markets from Central Africa to uh, uh, East Africa, from Central Africa to North Africa. Market expansion and facilitating that. 
We are in discussions with uh, our partners, African Development Bank and African Bank, to see what, what kind of trade finance facilities can be made available, can be made available that will target specifically small and medium enterprises. Uh, to enable a small and medium enterprise uh, in Yaounde to have access to the market in Kampala uh, in East Africa. This is, in my view, how we can make an impact uh, by building the capacity, the export capacity, making sure that there's trade finance that's available. And now with digital tools, uh, actually all of this is enabled. Uh, we are developing a tool called the Africa Trade Gateway, a digital platform that will enable small and medium enterprise interconnectivity, that will have uh, uh, information about the market, that they want to uh, uh, export to. It will have information about the client uh, or their counterparty. Digital enabled SME trade is what I believe um, will enable us to make an impact. Second, we have already, as you may be aware, uh, launched the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System, which uh, will enable us to overcome this challenge of the cost of trade in Africa. If you are in Ghana and you want to trade with somebody in, uh, uh, in Kenya, you have to first convert the Ghanaian city into the dollar. And you have to use typically a foreign uh, correspondent bank. Um, all of that is expensive. It costs Africa $5 billion annually to trade uh, in Africa. So working with African Bank, we have developed the Pan-African uh, Payments and Settlement System which is, again, a digital platform. Launched a few months ago in yes. the Ghanaian capital. in the Ghan Ghanaian capital, there are 48 commercial banks that are trading, uh, and their customers who are trading on that platform. Uh, it is the first truly continental payments platform that enables payment when you are trading across borders or across regions. It enables payment in your local currency, the counterparty receives payment in their local currency. Mm. This is a very critical tool for inclusivity of the trade agreement so that even small medium enterprises and young entrepreneurs, that they too can see the benefits of this agreement. You started talking about the digital environment on the continent mm -hmm. and driven mostly by young people who about 350 million of them, roughly the population of the world's largest economy, the United States of America. How much power, energy and resources is the trade agreement injecting in the digital environment, which of course is a window of opportunities? We are at the moment negotiating um, a digital trade uh, platform uh, or, or rather a digital trade protocol. And the digital trade protocol is one of the key protocols of uh, the AFCFTA. It will enable market access. Uh, it will establish broad uh, principles for regulatory uh, convergence. Uh, it will make sure that digital trade is placed really at, a, at the center of uh, commerce in Africa for decades to come. When you think about it, all of the digital innovations that we've seen in Africa thus far have happened in the absence of an overarching framework, uh, an overarching uh, a legal instrument, an overarching uh, enabling environment. And so the, and we know from evidence, uh, we know that where you have the appropriate regulatory framework for market access, for ensuring uh, uh, inclusivity, for developing new uh, technologies uh, and embedding them in that protocol, we know that uh, investors are more likely to invest in infrastructure, in digital infrastructure. Uh, so Google, Microsoft, and our own um, uh, uh, local players in, in the Mpesa. digital economy, Mpesa, for example, which happened uh, without a, a, an overarching legal instrument. So we can only imagine the possibilities where we have a truly continental uh, digital economy that is embedded on a, on a legal instrument. That's the objective. 
to cover things such as uh, payments, data flows, data sovereignty, uh, identifying uh, where Africa wants to actually have a focused area for competitiveness. There's no reason why Africa cannot be the management of data center of the world, the data processing center of the world. I see no reason why uh, we cannot be um, as competitive in, in data technology as any other part of the world. You've just mentioned um, PESA. In Africa, mobile banking was developed before in many other parts of the world uh, because we have a challenge uh, of uh, people not having bank accounts. So we had to find the, the, the easiest instrument to enable uh, mobile banking to be spread out. So these are the things that we are going to include in, in the protocol, protocol on digital trade. Mr. Secretary General, um, you have a very strong background in commerce, trade and issues, especially in your country of origin, South Africa and globally. Some of the biggest actors of the African economic environment have been with me here on this same set. Some of them sitting on the same place you are sitting here at the Hilton, Aliko Dangote, Tony Elumelu, the president of the Axiom to Back, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Orama, the uh, president of MTN, um, uh, 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 Raf Mupita, and the list can go on. Nearly all the CEOs of the banks on the continent. And they all tell me entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. What is the place of this entrepreneurship in a common market era in Africa before we come to the end of the interview? The, the trade agreement is not for governments. Uh, the trade agreement is for entrepreneurs and uh, the private sector in Africa. Governments don't trade. Uh, you know, bureaucrats like me don't trade. It's the private sector that trades. That's why... Um, it's so important for our governments and for us to understand that we have to move very, very swiftly and aggressively to implement uh, this agreement. Because when you harmonize customs procedures, when you harmonize transit of goods, when you enable uh, commerce to happen across borders, you will be contributing and you will actually be enabling uh, the amount uh, that you, 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 the figure that you mentioned of contributing close to $450 billion to Africa's GDP by the year 2035. That's what happens when you put the, the private sector at the center of a trade agreement. And so I, I agree entirely with, with their view that the AFCFTA must facilitate uh, the ease of doing business in Africa, particularly ease of doing business from one region to the other, from this country to the other. That's exactly what will make us to, th what will, will, will enable us to reach the objectives that we want to reach of lifting 100 million Africans out of extreme poverty, contributing 81% uh, to Africa's uh, uh, intra-Africa trade. It's not going to be done because of governments. Governments are very important, of course but it will be done because the private sector is the one that takes advantage of the new markets that uh, the AFCFTA uh, presents to, to, the, to, to the economy of Africa. Finally, um, much of the blame on the slowness of intra-African trade has been blamed or has been on Europeans, Americans, Asians, not giving the right environment for that to happen. In reality, when I was um, a student studying history, there is this book they call How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, and I'm sure that you have read it. Um, I know that you have tons and tons of documents you read and you go across policies and whatsoever. As somebody with an informed position, what do you think today is the greatest challenge to the fullest implementation or visualization of the African continental free trade area? And what, according to you, is the possible way out, or if you like, solution? The easiest uh, thing to do uh, it, it has been done, and that is to draft the law, uh, the AFCFTA's law. That's the easiest thing. Judicial security. 
Precisely. The, the most difficult is going to be to create opportunities uh, for industrialization based on that legal architecture, the AFCFTA. So that we don't just negotiate an agreement and have it on paper, but we negotiate an agreement and we say we want to encourage agro-processing in Africa. How do we uh, tie that to implementation of the AFCFTA so that we move beyond just the legal uh, text and see the reality, the commercial reality of that legal text? That to me is, is the greatest challenge that we face, but we're not unique. Uh, there are other parts of the world that have done it. Um, if you look, for example, at uh, Eastern European countries who joined the, the single market 30, 25 years ago, uh, today they are part of the EU uh, value chain and they see the benefits. Uh, some of them have doubled their GDP per capita as a result of being um, in a trade agreement that actually um, uh, where the legal text is, is translated into commercial opportunities. And, and that's, what, that's what we are aiming to do, is to translate the legal text into commercial opportunities so that it becomes, the AFCFTA becomes a reality uh, for millions and millions of Africans. The Secretary General of the General Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area, South African Wamkele Mene. Thank you very thank you. much indeed for being guest on Globe Watch. Thank you very much for the invitation. You're welcome.